Hello, Kirk. Hello. I am very happy to see you again. And me as well. And we will continue our conversations about the physics of life. So let's yes. sum up what we talked last time. So we came to the conclusion that there are social patterns, laws and principles on the same basis as in physics. These laws govern behavior of uh, communities of living objects. However, these patterns remain unnoticed and are denied and even hidden by social sciences because their use is not in the favor of those in power. A social scientist being on the financial leash of those in power are not interested in discovering and popularizing them. And even we, we quoted a famous physicist, very well known in the world, uh, Richard Feynman, who also said that, uh, according to him, social sciences are not sciences, but pseudosciences. However, you and me, we are convinced, persuaded that this kind of laws exists in human communities and they are like physical laws. There is, well, if something happens as an income in output, re we receive quite the same results. So this loss drives us to wars, to civilization collapses and so on and so on. We also talk that we cannot predict the future with, with 100% precision. However, we can predict some tendencies. And we agreed that this, uh, this exists. And we also said that we will try to fill this gap in the next episode. So in the next episodes, we will try to explain to our viewers some of these laws and we will discuss them. So the first topic, so the, the, the first phenomenon I would like to discuss is the natural pressure for social exploitation. Uh, you can find the description of this uh, mechanism functioning in social groups uh, on the website physicsoflife.pl in, in the vocabulary. You have to just uh, look for natural pressure for social exploitation. Okay, so let me explain what this natural pressure is. It's a natural mechanism functioning in social groups which favors unproductivity. So let's imagine a group of 100 people who have decided to live in the ideal community. They want to work and devote themselves to the community, sharing their production equally. And let them, let's imagine that they produce goods, every of, of these people produces goods worth of $100 per month, and thus the community can share 10,000 products value of $10,000 per month. Common goods are shared equally in accordance with established rules and everyone gets all kinds of goods with a value of $100. It's easy to know that the expenses and, and revenues are balanced. The balance is zero. I produced and gave a hundred. I got goods worth a hundred. So if we can imagine such a community, we have a confectioner makes cookies for $100 baker who bakes bread for $100, shoemaker who makes shoes for $100, tailor who makes pants, farmer produces potatoes, builder builds houses, plumber installs pumps, and the doctor heals. So I think that it's very easy to imagine such a, such a community. And now let's use the sensitivity analysis to this system and let introduce a disturbance to this model of the perfect community. This way of analyzing the system came from aviation. So I, you know, I was a student of, of aviation faculty of Polytechnic School of Warsaw, and I learned about this sensitivity analysis and about dis disturbances on, on my studies. So now let's imagine that one person has not worked at all. The reason, as usual, in the sensitivity analysis is not important. It could be a disease or laziness, it does not matter. 
This time, the community has developed $9,900, and after the split, each got 99, including the one that did nothing. Now, his balance is plus $99. He produced for zero, and he gained 99. The balance of the remaining people of the community is minus $1. They developed for 100 and gained 99. The value of goods received by each of them is down by $1. And now note that the profit of the non-working is very large in relation to the loss of the others. And moreover, the profit for non-working will be larger if the community is larger. Now let us examine the effect of the opposite disturbance. And now we assume that one of the members is devoted to enriching the community. Therefore, the member has decided to work hard, working day and night, and managed to produce twice as much as the others, generating for $200. This time the community has $10,100 to share. So everyone gets the goods for $101. So now the balance for this hard worker is minus 99. He produced for 200 and gained only for 101. While the balance of the others is plus 1. They produced for 100 and gained for 101. So, now let's sum up how the pressure for social exploitation works. We have negative disturbance. One does nothing, he's sick or just doesn't want to, to work, he works out zero. The community earns not 10,000 but 9,900 and after division everyone gets 99. The author of the negative disturbance gains plus 99. Individual profit of the others is minus one. And now the positive disturbance. One sacrifices himself for the community and works twice as effectively. He works out 200. The community earns not 10,000 but 10,100. After division, everyone gets 101. The author of the positive disorder gains minus 99, and individual profit of the others is plus 1. Now let's compare the situation of both perpetrators of these disturbances. The balance of the first one was 0, outlays and 99 profit, which translates into the statement that by doing absolutely nothing, he was ahead almost as he had worked normally. However, the balance of the second hard-working person who put in 200 and received 101 shows a deficit of $99. As we can see, the benefits of not working outweigh those accrued by working twice as hard. It is a natural mechanism which is inherent to social systems. And even though I, I, I will call it the social gravity, you know, I think that it's uh, very similar to the discovery of Newton as far as um, attraction of two material bodies are, are concerned. And we have this some kind of this social gravity. And I would say that uh, this is natural pressure, pressure for social exploitation. On the other hand, as we remember, each of us optimizes the balance of profit and loss. Or simply speaking, we prefer doing less for more. So it's uh, our innate uh, characteristic that if we buy, we want to get more products for less price. So if we combine this, our will to optimize our revenues, and the natural pressure for social exploitation, it just shows that uh, ideals community are just impossible. And it, you know, we can, we can saw this in the history. We have in America, New Harmony. We have kibbutzes in, in Israel. And we have the evidence that it didn't work. 
And now I would like to switch to the conclusions because, uh, you know, we have discovered, we have presented this law and uh, let's discuss, uh, let's discuss this, uh, these conclusions. So the first is that the good justification for doing nothing is highly profitable. Yeah, very much so. There's really, uh, it's biased, heavily biased to doing nothing, to underperforming. And there's very, there's no real reward for working harder to increase. You know, they, I think that they are even punished, you know, if you work, if you do, did uh, twice as much as possi possible and you get only one instead of 99 and the um, individual income of those who do nothing is, is huge. So in the opposite side, the, uh, uh, the individual income of the people who work a lot is also very huge, but in the negative values. So I think, you know, for me, it's obvious completely that it works like this and it must finish like this. So socialism, you know, it cannot exist. So the next conclusion is in societies that use equal dis uh, distribution of earned goods, few people care about increasing labor productivity. So we, in, in this, with this situation, we, have the, we dealt during the communist period of time when really nobody care about increasing labor productivity and finally the production dropped down in such an extent that we have nothing to, to eat. So we have problem even to buy, you know, a, a bread or, or milk, the essential, the essential food. Oh yeah, I saw this firsthand. Uh, I was working in the Soviet Union about a year before it finally collapsed and it was incredible. I was shocked at how even the city transit buses were barely working or would stall and they couldn't get them started and the passengers would be hoping that the bus starts. Things were falling apart everywhere. Uh, there was no incentive to at all to to work hard because there was no extra payment. There was no extra reward for working hard. Okay, so the next uh, next conclusion, disturbances of an opposite nature not necessarily generate effects on the opposite nature. So I don't know, maybe you can explain it better than me, but uh, you know, so I show that hard workers, he loses a lot and non-workers, he earns a lot, okay? So, uh, and also the people do, don't feel this, uh, this lose because uh, the society lose in the case of, of those who don't uh, produce, they lose only one for one dollar a person. And also the people are not seeing the person who is working twice as much as, as, as he can because they earn only one dollar more. So, you know, individual losses are very big and uh, the rest, just don't see it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for example, I needed a translator in the Soviet Union and I asked this uh, individual if they could help. And they said, yes, uh, I'm free three weeks out of the month. And the reason that I'm free, she said, is that uh, it only takes me one week to accomplish the quota of work that I'm supposed to do. And I asked her, well, why wouldn't you work extra hard and just get, a get further ahead? And she stared at me and she said, why would I ever do that? And I thought for a minute and I realized there would be zero reward for working harder. There's no reward whatsoever. And even if she did work harder, there are so many people involved in the Soviet Union, it would be undetectable any advantage for her of working harder. So there was absolutely no incentive to try and improve on an individual basis, but because so many people had the same attitude, the whole gigantic ship was slowly sinking. But by the time everybody sees that, no one individual can do anything about it. And because nobody thinks it's gonna make any difference at all. And how do you think if they know what we are talking about, this phenomenon of, of natural pressure for social exploitation, they will change anything or not? That's, you know, that's a difficult question because society is composed of people 
different kinds of people. Some have a high work ethic and some have no work ethic. And those with a lower work ethic uh, don't want to change. They don't want to work at all or they don't want to work harder. And I think another problem is that people keep thinking that if they try the same thing next time, it'll turn out different. Maybe it'll work next time. But someone once said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And sadly, I, I suspect that, as you mentioned at the outset, people have not thought through the, the fact that there are patterns, there are generally laws on, under which a society will flourish, but they're either uneducated in them or they don't think about them or they think in an ideal situation it'll all work out wonderfully in the end and it never does. And what do you think about the scientists, you know, because these people are devoted to find the truth, to seek for the truth, to seek for these laws, to see, to find out these principles and they don't care, they don't do this, you know, so, so um, we, the technical scientists, we were obliged we, because we have to build the planes, missiles, we have to build new kind of weapons, uh, you know, and it, it is already tested on the, on the battlefields and so on and so on. However, the social systems, they are tested by the history. Uh, some of, of us, I mean the people with, uh, who prefer to seek the truth than to be financed, just only making impression that they are making some science, we discover this. But why the people uh, devoted, so I mean the social scientists, they don't care about this. They don't even try to find and enlighten and show to the public these kind of laws. It's uh, uh, one of the problems that scientists or devoted people face, even if they're honestly doing research and they do discover these sorts of things, if the general population or the government who finances this doesn't agree, uh, they will be in trouble. Or one of the problems will be that they don't get their papers published. And I see this all the time. There's, there's a bias towards publishing those papers that agree with the people who are funding the research. And the people funding the research they don't know in advance what the answers are, but they know what they want to hear. They know what they want to believe. And so those people in academia who will uh, publish research that agrees with what those people want, what agrees with what the people who are funding the research want, they will get the funding. They will have those papers published. But those who dis those who find real results, like what you were discussing here, uh, that may be very unpopular with the local government. It may be very unpopular with the media and even the academic atmosphere at the time. And they might find themselves with no funding or very little funding. And they might also find themselves in certain circumstances having protests launched against their findings because Another problem is, is that you have a new generation coming up who has not learned the lessons of the past. And they believe in this ideal society of socialism and uh, they're not going to listen to honest scientists who've actually discovered these patterns. They're just going to write them off, call them names, uh, not publish the research, protest against them. And this is an ongoing problem, at least I see it all the time here in North America, that uh, its research can be biased itself by the funding process. And what one of the journals called Nature, which I regard as one of the top science journals in the world, uh, they recognized this problem. They had several articles on this problem and they identified that there are what they called perverse incentives to corrupt research, to corrupt the writing of papers and the publishing of papers, biased away from the truth, away from this publishing the real discoveries, biased in favor of what 
the government or the media or the academic culture at the time wants to hear. And if what they want to hear is different from what the discoveries are that are being made are, they will prefer to hear what they want to hear. Okay, so I'm asking the next question. Do you think that the all scientists are so afraid uh, so that they sold, uh, they sell their souls for, for money? No, I wouldn't say all scientists are like that at all. Those who are interested in discovering the truth and they try to publish the truth. Uh, I, I know of scientists out there who uh, will not be bought, so to speak, by funding. Unfortunately, they will find themselves struggling for funding, but they believe it's better to be honest and do honest research than to just capitulate to the pressures of what nature called perverse incentives, that is academic prestige, competition for funding, and so forth. So it's, the system is biased against them, or if the system is biased against them, there will be always, I think, a percentage of scientists and researchers who really are pursuing truth and are really trying to publish that. And they will get published from time to time. You may have to look um, more carefully to find those papers in the peer-reviewed journals but there are still a percentage of papers that do get published that I think focus on real discoveries and are not so biased to just um, just promote whatever the the media or the culture wants to hear. So there are honest scientists there. There are. Okay. I mean, no, I, I also noticed, noticed a phenomenon of, uh, let's say, auto-censorship because I made an article I would like to publish on a ResearchGate uh, website, it's devoted for scientists, about the table of development of so socialism. Uh, it's, uh, it's produced by Anatoly Fedoseyev, a fugitive from, uh, from the USSR. He was a top, top engineer there. And he made, you know, after his experience of living in the Soviet Union, he made a table how socialism develops from the very beginning, from the seizing of power, and then, then to the economical and civil, civilizational collapse. But, you know, I asked myself immediately, but if I publish this, how they will react? Maybe they will ban me and they will not uh, allow me to publish more. Yes. Yeah, that's very, that's, I, I see that too. I see scientists uh, making maybe a few comments to try and, make themselves appear a little more acceptable. Uh, often that'll be maybe in the conclusion of the paper, almost like a pledge of allegiance uh, so that they don't get banned or censored. There's some of that, that, a lot of it that goes on, I think. There was something else too. It was an academic conference I attended in Leeds, Leeds University in the UK. And on the last day of the conference, one of the most uh, well-known scholars, he teaches at Oxford University. And he was saying one of our strategies or a better strategy than just publishing in academic journals, which only a small percentage of the population reads, he says a better strategy or maybe more effective in the long run is to start writing and influencing the general public. And that was his closing speech to us that we really do need to get out there into the general public on social media YouTube, uh, whatever the general public is looking at and start presenting our arguments there and our findings and our research. Not stopping publi publishing in academic journals, but realizing that if the academic world or the journals are biased against what you have to say, often you can get much further more productive influencing of the population by speaking at the general level of the population. That's assuming that social media doesn't start banning you as well. And there are some topics now that even social media will start censoring and banning. Yeah, yeah. I am, I am seeing this because I'm working on, on, on this, on the physics of life every day. And I am trying to publish also in a scientific 
uh, websites and also for the public. Okay, keep going. We have to, we have to work, I think. Uh, nevertheless, we have, uh, you know, small results. Let's go back to our uh, conclusions. So the community doesn't notice when someone cheats or when someone works more because the individual losses or gains of others are almost imperceptible. Individual losses of or profits are disrupted. They are divided by the number of community members. So I would like to ask you a question uh, here. When we talked about John and Wynn research, it was, let's say, it was an experiment. It was just an observation. But here, with this uh, phenomenon, of, uh, phenomenon of natural pressure for so social exploitation, I think, I, 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 am, I am sure, so I am convinced that this is some kind of physical law. Do you agree or maybe you have another view on this? Because I think that, uh, you know, natural pressure is a very, very physical. You don't need to make experiments. It's just, you know, uh, you make the mental experiment and that's it. It, it works like this. There is, it's obvious. Yeah, I think I would agree. Uh, I just, the example that you gave is a beautiful example. And I think that most people would have no difficulty understanding it unless it's their own bias that puts uh, blinders on their eyes to see that. But in general, I, it's, the other option is, and this uh, too is an experiment, I guess maybe a mental experiment, is to, well, imagine that social flourishing is random. There are no laws, there are no patterns. It's just a random event that certain cultures flourish and others don't. But I think it would be very few people, if any, in their right minds would endorse that, that it's random. There are very clear patterns out there in history. But I fear that people are not learning from history. I studied history in, in school, but we were always memorizing dates and certain bills passed in Parliament and certain wars. But there was virtually nothing said about what lessons we can learn. And now in the 21st century, we have even problems there because people are modifying history. So back to the experimental aspect of things, I think it's, it's very clear that there are certain factors that even the example that you gave here in earlier, that are very easy to see. There's, there, it's, obvious that there is very little to be gained, if anything, in a large population where it's dedicated to this socialist structure that you explained. It's, uh, I am always astonished why people think that that's going to work. If it is going to work, it's going to have to be something like in North Korea, for example, where there is severe punishment, severe punishment for not performing you might find yourself in a work camp or executed. But who wants to live in a society like that? And it's not really working if it requires severe punishment. And then you look at the overall production of the country and you can see they still can barely feed themselves. So I think there are very clear patterns that we can obviously see from history, but the problem is learning the lessons of history, which is a giant experiment itself or a giant series of experiments. We can actually watch what happens, draw observations from it like Unwin did, and then even make predictions. And in, in case, in Unwin's case, he made three predictions of what happens when a society deviates from high constraints on sexual morality. and then we can use those predictions as we do in science to, to watch our society to see what happens when it crosses that tipping point, which it has. And again, what I observe are all three predictions have already come true. So there are definite patterns out there. There are clear, uh, and we've only touched on one, I think this, the, there are many clear factors involved in the success of a society, for example, a high work ethic, but even a high work ethic in the population will slowly erode away 
under socialism. Yes, yes, it destroys, you know, I, I, I witnesses this, you know. I think you, you touched very, very interesting topic because probably the history teachers, they never did such analysis as we are doing in technical sciences. As I showed here, you know, the sensitivity analysis, let introduce a disturbance and let's see what will happen how it develops and so on. And let's see whether it fits to the history which already occurred, we, we dealt with. Uh, maybe it's our role nowadays, you and me, and maybe the people like, uh, like we, we invite everyone who, who is watching this video to, to come and, and maybe to, to bring some new topics and, and talk about them. Uh, but maybe we have to develop the new met methodology of teaching history. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to see that, but already I am afraid that certain people who are activists uh, will want to reinterpret history, and it's happening right now. I know in my country they're reinterpreting history, modifying it, reshaping it, to make it give the lessons they want it to give. But the history that they're using is, is not the real history. It's been reshaped and reinterpreted. So even there, we have to have a way to safeguard the integrity of the historical record, or at least analyze it to see what biases are there. And I, I do admit that, for example, Julius Caesar, when he wrote his account of his wars, all the historians will admit that yes, Julius Caesar had a bias. But once we know what that bias is, we can still learn from his accounts of the Gallic Wars, because now we know the bias. We don't change these accounts. We don't modify them and delete or censor some history so that this history over here will support us and this history that doesn't, we censor it. That should not be done. We should not be revising history. That's, that's the big challenge. If we start learning from history, which we have to, we have to learn from history. But somehow we need to safeguard the honesty, integrity of the historical records, while at the same time searching for what biases might have been there. So let's go back to the, our conclusions. We have two more points. The more numerous the community is, the less it sees that it is being robbed and the less it sees that someone wants to work more for it. I think it's obvious, okay, we already talked about this. And the last one is uh, if you can find a good way to convince members of a community composed of one million individuals to each give you one dollar, you will become a millionaire. Yeah, it shows just, you know, the, the numbers, okay, so <laughs> there is nothing to discuss here. And also I would like to read some remarks. So. I think that Aristotle already saw this problem and he said, he used the expression to explain this. He said like this, the larger the number of owners have the property, the less the others take care of it. Har Gareth Hardin, the history of great fortunes shows that the tactics of those who built them was clandestine socializing the costs and privatizing the benefits. We see it in the, in the modern Russia. So now the Frederick Bastia, so as I said, it's a French political and, and philosopher. If a move will result in the loss of one franc, so it's a franc, one dollar in France, for each of the thousands of people and gain a thousand francs by one person, the latter consumes a lot of energy, while the former would rather put up little resistance. It is therefore likely that the person who makes the effort gaining 1000 francs will gain them successfully. I think it shows why we have bigger and bigger countries, because if we have more citizens in the country, we as the rulers can get more money. I think that it's clearly explained by Frederick Bastia. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
even what we're seeing right now in Canada, our, our government has decided that we should have as many as one million new uh, immigrants per year, as many as that. And their main reason, and they're right up front about this, is economics, is that they believe that it's going to be an economic gain. But when you actually look at who's gaining, it's the only the government that gains. It's not in fact, the immigrants don't have houses to live in. There's just too many people coming. There's no, not enough jobs. But yet, at the same time, the incremental gain of one person multiplied by a million does benefit those who are, um, well, I guess in this case, our government. Okay, Kirk, I think that we said everything about this topic. Do you have something to add or we just switch to, to the end? I, I think that what you've said and this whole experiment that you laid out at the beginning is crystal clear. It should be patently obvious to anyone who wants to think of what the problem is. So I think it's what you've said, Jan, is, is right on. It's, it's very clear. Okay, so let's now uh, invite our viewers for our next, co next conversation. And it came up to my mind that we can discuss uh, uh, the trigger for this next subject, because I would like to discuss the difference in two systems. The system of uh, hard work in, on a free market, uh, of the producers, of the workers, and the system uh, how the politicians functions, you know, to show that, that they live in a different, different world. But the trigger for this subject was uh, falling down educational systems in Canada and in Poland. So if you agree, we can continue with this maybe in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting subject and very important. Yeah, I think what you're doing, it's so important. <laughs> it's so important. I have never heard such a beautiful, concise critique of socialism until your your uh, example there it's so obvious i i wish this were taught in schools it's just it's beautiful kirk thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion and <coughs> we invite our viewers for our next talk yeah i look forward to that <laughs>